Welcome into the King's Beat podcast. We've gone live. Uh, we we've are, gone to plaid. Course, we've gone plaid. Uh, yeah. Brendan has no idea what that means, but we have gone plaid. Uh, I am James Ham, King's Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. We are, of course, a Blue Wire podcast brought to you by Price Picks. Joining me tonight, we're doing this is off the cuff. We, we decided at the last second, hey, let's just go live. Uh, joining me tonight, Fox 40, Sean Cunningham. What's going on, Sean? That had some extra oomph to it. I think it's because we're live. We haven't done this in a while. It's been a little while. I'm I'm very happy about it. So it's okay. good to be here. And of course, we are joined by Brendan Nunes from the King's Pulse podcast. Brendan, how are you? I'm doing well. Doing well. Can't complain. I'm happy we're live. Shout out to Secure into Yahoo for being on it. We haven't even posted it yet, and he's in here. Yeah. Um, he's ready to go. That's usually Secure into Beam. I think so. But uh, there's this hilarious thing that's going on where a lot of people in the chatty house from ESPN 1320 have decided to add Yahoo to their name because secure into Bagley. My bad. Because, uh, of course, there's just been some discord. There's just just like the dis- app <laughs> discord, like the app. There's just been some dis- like some, some back discourse. Forth. Discourse. That's what I meant. That's what I meant. Okay. <laughs> All right. So let's get to this. Sorry. Uh, hello, everybody. Number one, uh, we are brought to you by Price Picks. Um, I've been having a bad run once again in Price Picks, but that doesn't mean anything. It's been a good. It's been a good season. I've had a good run. Um, I believe Matt George like hit it big the other night. He was very excited. Um, you know, did. there was overtime. A- did him a favor. The overtime, there was a Malik Monk assist that came in huge. So if you don't know what Prize Picks is, uh, down below in the description here on YouTube, there is a link to Prize Picks. Use the the password Kings Beat, all one word, to uh, to get a hundred dollars matching on your first investment. Um, you basically, what you do is you choose whatever sport you want. There's every sport imaginable. There's tennis. There's golf. There's MMA. There's basketball. There's NFL. You choose players. You uh, you look at all of the the different choices that they have on each given night, and you just choose more or less. Uh, and it's just a cool way to add something new and different to your your uh, sports watching, sports viewing. So um, it adds a new element for sure. I I probably should avoid just doing like giant six plays every single time. That's probably not a good way to win money. Uh, but that's okay. Um, yeah, I think you're fine, man. Yeah. Just one, one day, one day, just one day I'm going to hit right, Sean. I think and, so. And and then we'll just weep openly while we're that's sitting right. there. Like, <laughs> Hey, you, you swing for the fences and I respect that. Yeah. Cause if you hit like, Oh man, that one night I, I miss, I miss by 0.5 of a point of a huge payoff. Uh, first and, uh, foremost, let's, uh, let's hit the, uh, the basics. If you're watching here on YouTube and you don't mind, give us a thumbs up. That helps with the algorithm of life. Uh, jump on board with the King's beat, go to the King's and become a premium subscriber to the King's beat. So you get everything sent right to your, your inbox. Uh, we are getting questions about, do we have a virtual happy hour coming up soon? Like, <laughs> uh, yes, we, we In will. I, it's just brutal. I, I gotta be honest. This. This season has been go. really tough. Uh, like between, uh, like Sean's got stuff going on. I've got stuff going on. Brendan uh, got a new job this season. Um, it's been difficult just huh. to get us all on the same podcast, let alone a podcast twice a week, let alone an additional uh, happy hour. So we're gonna do. Uh, if nothing else, I will do so many happy hours this summer that you won't even want to see us anymore. You'll be like, stop sending me links to happy hours and uh we'll also we will do an in-person happy hour this this summer for oh, sure oh yeah oh oh i like that uh benny in the chat pointed out something that i was literally looking up because the minute i saw brendan this this evening i was like it kind of looks like blake snell is it just because i just saw a picture of blake snell in a giants uniform in the dugout in spring training just a few moments ago um but no i think it is goatee is not quite as robust hmm. but it's and I uh, don't Blake Snell's a giant and that's a good thing I don't think Brent has ever won a Cy Young he definitely hasn't no it's TBD no it's you know we don't know we don't know it's, check my baseball he's still, reference he's still young enough yeah. he's still young enough I am uh, fully committing to the Giants this year 
Oh, I oh you're bought bandwagon. I 100% bandwagoner. <laughs> so can I ask a question? How, how many, how many giants hats do you have? Um, this is, I think the third and, the and how many A's hats do you have? Down. Um, I think three as well. So you own more A's hats. Than giants it's the same hats. amount. It's the same amount. Oh, it's the same. I'm not good it with math. That's, okay. that's embarrassing. You can't yeah. have both, and you can't have the 50-50 hat. You have the 50-50 yeah, hat running. I'm just going to come to your house and slap you around. The 50, no, like, no, no. That's not no. happening. Don't no. worry. I don't like the upside-down logo. That just... It, I know you don't. I know you don't. That's, that's why like, I wear it just for you. Just for me? Okay. Yeah. So the, the Giants did sign... Fan, you'd want that. They signed Blake Snell, but the contract is crazy. So basically, yeah. it's a two-year deal, but the second year is a is a player option. This is a worry that, you know, again, uh, Scott Boris clients, right, are all doing this where they're signing one-year deals with one-year op- uh, like outs, or they're signing two-year deals with one-year outs. And then his contract is like $15 million up front, and if he picks up the second-year option, he gets a $17 million signing bonus, which becomes part of this year's salary, not next year's salary, and then he'd be another $32 million next year. Absolutely. Although bizarre. that signing bonus, that signing bonus would be January of next year. Yeah, January of next year, which is just wild. Yeah, yeah, it's crafty. I kind of dig it. Um, Me too. Okay. Well, hey, we got a bunch of uh, Sacramento King stuff to talk about. We do. Um, first and foremost, I, we do have we do have news, and I, I don't think we really know what the news is. We have news, though. I, I mean, on the NBA injury report this afternoon. Kevin Herter is now listed as out with a dislocated left shoulder. I haven't been able to get anything else on that. I hadn't really tried because it's been a long day, but I did reach out and I haven't heard back anything. Do you have anything other than that, Sean? No, and I would expect some results from an MRI, whether it's clean or dirty. Um, Even if it's just a, a dislocated shoulder, I would imagine there's been an MRI and we don't have necessarily any results on that yet but even if it's clean you should probably have some results um i would imagine right now it's just a dislocation and they know that it's a um certainly out for uh wednesday's game in toronto and i think what they're trying to could be trying to determine with the travel day being today going east coast going through customs going into canada um they may not have been able to accurately put together a timetable but that's pure speculation on my part all we know is right now a left shoulder dislocation and that he's out for Wednesday. Okay. And Brennan, you haven't heard anything either, right? No, I don't got nothing else outside of that really. Okay. So here's the problem with a dislocated shoulder. Uh, number one, a dislocated shoulder in a lot of circumstances is better than a separated shoulder because a separated shoulder has like different grades of separation. So you can grade one, grade two, grade three. And that just basically depends on it, it's, separated and it's pulled there there's four like tendons that hold your shoulder in the socket and when you have a separation basically you stretch those tendons out and it's not good a dislocation means the thing popped out your the ball dropped out and you basically have popped your shoulder out of the socket now it's conceivable that they were able to put his shoulder back in the socket and he didn't do any damage. And that would be a good thing for Kevin Herter because like there are ways that you can damage the shoulder all over the place with a dislocation. So that's why we have to, why we have to wait for an MRI. Uh, it's a, it's an injury that could actually be like pretty dramatic for him and be a long-term thing. It could also be something that he bounces right back from. And right. that's just kind of the nature. If he didn't do any other damage, then it's just a matter of like, okay, like how much pain is he in? Did they get the, the shoulder back in the socket quickly? Uh, it, did it, you know, again, did it do any other damage or did it just like, don't, it dropped out of place and he, he goes full lethal weapon on us and just pops the thing back in. <laughs> Brennan doesn't get that. Brennan doesn't get that at I all, but Sean no. does. That's all that matters. Mill Gibson just slamming his shoulder right back into place. I'll ask, I'll say this though. Um, the, uh, the 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 kind of wise ass in me wants to believe that it's still dislocated because the injury report says so. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a that's a good question, Sean. Uh, like, first of all, like you should be able to pop that thing right back in. 
like think, it, yeah. it doesn't feel good. They they have doctors there though, and it is like more of like a, like you pull the thing out one way and then it goes back in the socket. Uh, like you don't want. I think it's a sublocation when it won't go back in the socket, and then then you have all kinds of mess. Uh, and that's bad because then it can require you to like force the thing back in or, or like it can become a bigger issue. Um, so we're, we're all on a wait and see thing with Kevin Herter. Um, to be honest with you, it was a really weird situation to watch it play out down below. Like it happened right on our end of the court down below us, uh, on our end where Brennan and, and Sean and I sit. And at first I thought he had heard it when he put his hand down, but that just wasn't the case. It looked like even he, he almost put his right hand down and hurt that as well while he was falling. But, uh, the replay was, was just kind of weird. And I think we're all left with, wow, did he break his wrist? Did he, but what he was doing is trying to stabilize his shoulder by grabbing his wrist. And it was a bad situation. So, uh, yeah, yeah thoughts and prayers well, out to, to Kevin Hurt. And, and the trainer, Joel Nolan, I mean, when he went out to him, it, it's, he's immediately looking at his shoulder and, yeah. uh, I, you know, I've separated, I've, I've dislocated my shoulder before. I don't want to say separated by, and, and when I was in high school playing football and not only is it extremely painful and I'm not trying to compare mine to Kevin's, but you do, you hold the way you hold your arm. The one thing that threw me though, was they had a towel over his towel. wrist and, and, and I'm thinking, oh man, is that like trying to hide like some grody you know, I say grody because that's what Meg just said in the in the chat there, and it's in my mind now. Uh, is that just some disgusting maybe thing on it, uh, like a fractured wrist at that point? But um, no, I mean, fortunately, it's hopefully just a clean dislocation. Pop it back in, and hopefully, he doesn't miss very uh, very much time. Yeah, yeah I mean, Brent, when he went well, down, yeah. he did kind of. I mean, he was pointing towards his wrist for sure, and it looked to be red, and kind of from the camera angle, looked like it which is maybe misshaped a little bit, um, but floppy. Yeah, it was it was a weird moment for sure. I thought it was wrist, but as Sean kind of laid out um, or you guys both did, definitely every everybody saying shoulder and that would make sense lines up with all that. But it's a weird moment. And, you know, I guess there it adds a layer to this conversation of everybody's been in love with Keon and Kevin's had been struggling prior to this and now it's going to lead to no chance or no choice, but uh, Keon getting more opportunity here. Yeah, I definitely agree there. Um, before we move on uh, past this, I think we've all watched, like it was a weird buildup. So this happens like a minute 47 into the game, right? And I, I know like Damien talked about it today on, on uh, D-Lo and Casey. He's like, I got the James Ham tweet that, you know, it's game time in Sacramento. He's like, and then before I could get out of my car and into the house, I get a tweet that Kevin Herter is down on the ground. All of this happened within the first, like, again, minute 40 something of the game. There was something going on between Herter and Desmond Bain before the injury. Did you guys, did you um, see all of this like transpiring? So Kevin had just got called for the travel, uh, like the play, the offensive play before. And Bain went over and just hammered Herter to knock the ball out of his hands. Then on the other end of the court, Herter got all up in Bain's business and they and then Bain kind of shoved him back afterwards. Then we get the turnover, the breakaway, and a dude just went and karate chopped a, another player. I thought it was a little bit of bad blood and I don't know what was going on there, but for you know, the first two minutes of a game, it got a little it got a little chippy, a little out of control. Yeah, I, I yeah. honestly did not notice any of the back and back or back and forth that had been going on initially. One of my first reactions is Desmond Bain is a really dang strong dude. I mean, you can very much see it. And there must have been a whole lot of force in that downward motion. But I, I didn't think anything dirty or anything like that. Or, um, yeah, I hadn't picked up on any of the bad blood. It's just kind of swiping for the ball and really strong guy hit Kevin just in the right spot, really, or the wrong spot, I guess. Welcome to, I mean, I know that's not a playoff team, but welcome to playoff ba basketball. I mean, that is, that's what we're seeing lately. I mean, these past few games, even the Lakers, who I would argue are, aren't very physical team, um, showing some physicality because that's sort of the recipe has been for the Kings. But in recent games, even in some of these losses, I think the Kings have done a really remarkable job in holding their own and responding well to that chippiness, that physicality, also kind of keeping their head a little bit, uh, not only with the way, 
the physicality comes from the opposition, but how the officials kind of factor their way into that as well. So uh, I, I give I give that whole team right now a ton of credit with the way not only they're playing, not only the way they're playing defensively, especially, but just the way they're responding to so much of that physicality and kind of getting sorry about that that little 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 uh freeze there but getting getting ready for gearing up for for postseason basketball because that's exactly what these games feel like yeah i agree i'd also point out that whatever's happening with the officials is wild like whatever the mandate is from the league and i'm and i'm with De'Aaron fox it's bs like there's clearly a mandate since the all-star break that offense it needs to be cut back. That that the physicality needs to go. That it needs to go up. That they need to uh, swallow their whistles and, and let the players play. And to be honest with you, it's gotten chippy in multiple games. And I, I think we're seeing an escalation. And I I don't think it it's it's not like a, a gradual escalation in in the way the game is called. And and I actually believe that it won't be long until we see a, a pretty substantial fight. Because it's all of a sudden like, oh, well, that's legal. I didn't know that that was legal. I can just hammer you or I can shove you out of the way or we're not calling anything as opposed to, you know, the touch fouls that we get so accustomed to at the NBA level. It's just really bizarre to me. And so I, I do think that there's going to be a an escalation as we see, you know, it get closer and closer to playoffs. You could kind of feel it, though. Like, yeah. do you remember what I said when I came to my seat last night right before the game started? I don't. I said, feels was like it there's going to be a fight tsunami? tonight. Was no, it no, tsunami? That's, that's halftime. That's halftime. <laughs> no, before the game, remember I said, this feels like there's going to be a fight tonight. We need a good old-fashioned fight tonight. And then there was. There was a fight down below us in the fight. stands. There was a fight in the crowd. There was oh, you yeah. know, the injury. to. There was a physical game, injury to Kevin. Um, yeah, it had that kind of tense feeling to it for sure defensively it's kind of helped the kings the last five games they're second in defensive rating 103.2 i think they've played really well defensively now there are they are fouling a lot they're sending teams on average of 26 free throw attempts a game in these last five and there's some there's some high attempt ones in here with the 35 to milwaukee or we just saw memphis take 30 so there, there is that aspect, but I think that the physicality has been good for them. I think it's one of the things that the Kings seem to have learned the most last postseason was they're not going to call everything and, you know, we can increase our physicality. And I think them already being able to do that now has helped them defensively, although there's definitely the frustration of clearly De'Aaron and coaches said something as well. They don't feel like they're getting the same whistle necessarily. No, I get that. But I also like there's been a couple of games where they have got the whistle. Yeah. I mean, even against the Knicks, wasn't it something like 26 free throw attempts to 12 for, for the Knicks? Like there, there was one game that was lopsided. So I think the Kings, it's just weird. Just, just like all of a sudden the game looks different and I don't mind it. It looks more like nineties and early two thousands NBA love basketball. It. I do too. I love the physicality. I hate the touch foul. I can't stand watching foul grifters. Like the the Luka Doncic, uh, James Harden, uh, Austin Reeves, and Kevin Martin, Trey, Trey Young, Kevin Martin was one of the great foul yeah. grifters of all time. It to me, it's just like it's not fun to watch. It's ugly basketball, and I, I want to see a flow. I want to see the game go back and forth. I don't want to see a bunch of dudes miss t making and missing free throws. To me, it just doesn't it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's funny. Uh, Shortcake one eight two, great name. Uh, pointed out, just wait till Trey Lyles is back. And that, it is funny when you think about it because a lot of these games, you know, you can argue that Trey might be their, one of their most physical players. Um, and I'm not even factoring in the fight that he had with the Bucks last season. Um, but like, maybe it's because they haven't gone small all that many times this season. Um, it's still relatively new. Maybe there's not enough film on it yet, but I'm curious as to what this looks like when they do get a physical player like Trey Lyles back uh, and when they've been playing small and clearly have been able to respond to physicality and chippiness in a, in a positive manner, I wonder how it'll look even when he gets back. Yeah. And how much do they miss Trey Lyles right now? I mean, to me, it's, it's huge. Not only do they miss his scoring off the bench, but they Lex. can't go small ball, you know, like it, the fact that this, this team would love to go like with a three guard set with Trey Lyles and Keegan Murray or Trey Lyles and, 
uh, and Harrison Barnes at the next to him, but they can't right now because they don't have him. It's it's been difficult, and you know it, it does look like. Uh, while I'm on that note, Sasha Vizenkov is questionable, and it looks like he's ready to make a return. He's coming off a grade three ankle sprain. I think they're probably going to be a little cautious with him about like minutes and stuff like that, uh, just because he's been gone for a long time. And and not only that, but he had had he rolled both ankles. Like he hurt the one ankle, and then went into the game and hurt the other ankle. And then at practice, he he rolled another he rolled the first ankle so like he's been struggling with these ankle issues like for the last i don't know two months leading up to this but like the kings need somebody else they need another scorer off the bench and if if we were having this podcast and and kevin martin i mean kevin herter had not hurt himself i would have been advocating for keon ellis to start and kevin herter going to the bench and not just because you know one of them is playing really well but because I think Kevin Herter would have more opportunity with the second unit to get himself right. It's just really difficult to find shots with that starting unit. And Kevin Herter going to the bench may have been a good thing, especially with with Trey Lyles out, where all of a sudden maybe he can get 12 shots coming off the bench. Yeah, I mean, I think getting Sasha back could be really big right now with Trey out as well and and Kevin being pretty TBD. It, like you mentioned, James, I would expect there to be a process of bringing him back with just the amount of time he's missed, but he could fill that small ball five role as well. Like that we've seen them play with that a little bit earlier this year. And it wouldn't surprise me if they tried to go back to that a little bit to test it out the end of this year. I mean, he seems like the type of guy to me that would come in in the second half of a playoff game and hit three threes and really like randomly change the tide of a playoff game. You know, I I think that just playing with, what he can still give you in this final stretch um, could be interesting to have him just as a wild card in a game that you can't hit a shot to save your life in the postseason. And you mean uh, Sasha? Yes. Yeah. 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 No, I agree. Yeah. I, it's funny, James, you and I were having the conversation about it and, and, and I'm a little indifferent. Like to me, I, I, I do subscribe to the theory that you need to have Kevin Herter at his best. If you're going to, if you're going to be anything. Um, but at the same time, I think this is a blessing in disguise. And and what I mean by that is you're not going to kill or further kill Kevin Herter's confidence by going up to him again this year and say, Hey, we got to go with Keon Ellis because he's playing great. Six and O as a starter, 56 point differential uh, against our opposition. When he starts, Um, we, we got to ride the hot hand. You need a, a pick me up in the worst way, go find it on the bench. And rather than kill the confidence more, use this as an opportunity to work his way back to that moment. And I think Mike Brown may have even hinted at it, maybe even indirectly when he said that when Kevin's ready to go, or if we go in a different direction. So maybe part of Kevin being ready to go is all right, your shoulder's fine again. How have you now worked your way back into that starting lineup? It's a little, you know, NFL like it's a little quarterback like and writing the hot hand and, you know, but it's not like a quarterback because he was also struggling mightily as he has this season. So I think this is, could be a blessing in disguise to ramp his activity up, maybe find his confidence and hopefully for him peak at the right time without totally killing his confidence. Brennan probably should turn his mic on. Yeah. Might help. Might help. Just saying. Is there any aspect of like an unwritten rule that you don't lose your starting lineup because or your starting spot because you got hurt? No, no, it's no, called no. it's I mean, called getting your ass Wally pipped. That's what it's called. Yeah. So I don't know. Look, if you know who Wally Pip is, Brennan. He doesn't. I've heard the name. That's okay, so Wally Pip was the first baseman on the New York Yankees, and I can't remember like nineteen nineteen or nineteen twenty. Yeah, uh, he decided to take a, a game off and. Lou Gehrig, a rookie, started in his place and never, ever, 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 ever came off the field for what twenty three hundred fifty six games or something. Um, yeah, so that's it's so it's called getting Wally pipped. So Keon Ellis is Lou Gehrig. Is the point in here. this scenario? Yes, <laughs> okay. All exactly. Right. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I mean, like, look, I, I think like things were wrong. Things were broken. But it's really hard, like Sean says, to to just kind of destroy somebody's confidence even more. I kind of was of the opinion that it was we had got to the point where it's almost it almost would have been better for Kevin to say it himself, like, "Hey, right. 
I think there's more opportunity for me on the bench right now, and I know I'm struggling, and I know Keon's playing really well. Is is there a way for us to switch for a short term? But look, if if Keon Ellis steps in and plays the way he did against Memphis or so many other games this season, it's going to be really difficult for Mike Brown to ever make a change back. And and I think that that's we just watched the, him uh, Keon Ellis go out and have five blocks in a game. Like how if, you have a guy who plays 33 minutes. He finishes with five points, seven rebounds, three assists, five blocks and a steal. Like he doesn't even have to score. And he's so incredibly impactful on the game. And it's something that, you know, the Kings just don't have. He is, he is like the missing link. And I don't, what are you guys, what are your early thoughts? Yeah. I don't buy this six and O thing. I'm not in on the six and O right. thing. It's, Six and zero is over sixty six games with like, I think he had two in November, one in December, and then three here in in March. But yeah, I'm, his activity is exactly what. Look, it's not coming out of nowhere. You've seen what type of player he can be. Um, we've I've talked to him a lot over the last few days, even uh, off camera about it because I told him I said, even last night I I told him I said, um, you know I I was a little critical of, of, of how you, how you played that game on the offensive end. Um, and, and he kind of agreed, uh, obviously defensively, the, the five blocks are fantastic. He only had two turnovers, but he, he was having some tough moments on the offensive end of the ball. He made up for him in spades. And this is a guy who absolutely, I, we talked about it, I think it, uh, at practice on Sunday. And then again, I believe on, uh, on Monday, or not Monday, but but a shoot around where we're talking about him as a defender and how so much of what he's already done translates so well to the NBA. And then there's a portion of it where him getting better in some of those areas or even kind of refining that game literally just comes down to experience. And uh, so it's no secret and no surprise that he can impact the game that way. It's also why, you know, I do push back on the notion that he has to start because like I feel like it just comes down to coaching. It's the same thing like with Malik Monk. You have two dudes who absolutely know their role uh, and they are often put in the best position to succeed. Um, neither one of those guys have to start uh, in order to be impactful and, and and a winning type of player for their team because they fuel their team in, in, the, in things that they need. You know, Malik in his way and then Keon in his way with activity and defense. And I really love, I got to be honest, guys, I really like seeing Keon with Fox, Keon, with Davion Mitchell together at different points of the game has been really fun to watch. Yeah, I think those three-yard lineups have definitely been working well, and and Keon's a big part of that. I think there are still some growing pain things. You pointed out the offense, Sean. I think a lot of the moments I've seen throughout this year handle-related. Like there was a early in Houston when he was starting in some of those games as well, had troubles kind of bringing the ball up the court at times if he was getting hounded a little too much. Luckily, you play him with another guard. That helps Malik Monk often out there with him, like you're kind of mentioning there. And offensively, I think the fact that he's just a good three-point shooter, I think, helps a lot on that end of the floor. He shot above 40% at Alabama, did the same thing in the G League last year. I think he's just a good three-point shooter. And eventually, once he starts getting defended a little bit more that way, if we get to that point, I think that would be a big step and kind of thing that he will then have to grow through as well. But there's progress here um, for sure. And some of the, what he provides with deflections defensively does so much for getting out on the other end. Um, just it's interesting watching him and Davion because they play defense so differently. And Keon is a very handsy player. Sometimes that can still get him in some foul trouble, but I think overall you kind of take that for where he's at right now. Guy, this is the first time he's getting minutes. He had told me previously that I kind of assumed he always had been a guy that cared about defense. And really when he was at Florida Southwest uh, Juco, he was a scorer and he said he didn't even care about defense until he got to Alabama. And he realized that was the only way he was going to get on the floor. So we're talking like four years, this guy's actually played defense and this is the point that he's had already. Yeah, he really, he has so much to his game that, that like, I, I really, like, I'm going to pull up, there's a uh, a comment here by, by Be Well. Uh, Keon can be our Doug Christie. Um, I think it's actually an interesting player comp, and this is why, 
First of all, Doug was a great offensive player when he was coming up. He became a defensive player when he was with the Knicks and he was stuck watching from the bench and Herb Williams pulled him aside and said, Hey, look, man, if you're going to make it in this league, you're going to have to learn how to play defense. And like, why not learn how to do it right now against Allen Houston and Chris Childs and Charlie Ward and uh, John Starks in practice every day. Like you need to figure it out and really worked with him. Um, the reason why I think he can be this team's Doug Christie is because the, the 2000 early 2000s Sacramento Kings was a collection of offensive talent. It was just like an incredible collection of offensive talent. And what, you know, if you're talking about Bibby Stoyakovich, Weber and, and D bots, sometimes you can have too many offensive players on the court. And a lot of times you can, because we've seen it the last you know year and a half, the Kings can't play defense because all of their players are offensive weapons. So if you take one offensive player off the court and you replace him with a defensive player, I don't know about you guys, but all of a sudden the balance of the team looks a hundred times better. So we're watching like go to the Bucks game and that's a game where Keegan Murray doesn't play and Kevin Herter and Harrison Barnes come out bombing. Like they're, they're shooting threes nonstop in the first quarter. They get the Kings off to a good start. The Kings end up winning. You come to the next night and, and Kevin Herter sat and Keegan was back and Keon Ellis started. And again, look at the production of Keegan Murray and Harrison Barnes in that game. They go 11 of 20 from three and combined for 42 points. And I think the the ingredient isn't as much that it's Keon Ellis as much as it is there's only four offensive players. Keon will take shots, but he doesn't look for shots and he's not asked to do that. The other guys, all of a sudden, there's more shots to go around, and the team just instantly felt more balanced. And so I think that that's one of the things, whether it's Keon Ellis next season or it's somebody else like Keon Ellis, a, you know, like primo version of, we're getting to see what the Kings look like with a 3 and D player alongside the other four starters. And I think the early results are like, oh my gosh, look how much better they look. Just the whole flow, not only on the defensive end, but on the offensive end, looks way better as well. And and Keon's not even in the right spot all the time. You know, he's still got a, plenty to learn. So that's kind of where I'm at. I, I like that the way that the team is, is sort of like shaking out here. It just looks like it's more complete and more well-rounded as a group when they're on the floor. Yeah, I mean, I think that it first thing it makes me think of is like Keegan specifically, that's a guy that how many times have we talked about go get more shots up and weirdly in that Memphis game, he shot it 17 times. He was only six to 17, but I, I thought that he could have gotten way, way more looks up. There were a couple times that he was too passive for my liking, but I would imagine that it's easier to go into that with an aggressive mindset when there's one less offensive guy on the floor with you. And therefore you have a little bit more responsibility in that aspect. So I've definitely noticed it. And I think that, it's worked well. Hopefully Keegan specifically is the one to me where I'm like, dude, just get more shots up. I, even if it, you're not hitting them well, when you're getting them up in the first quarter, keep going, please. Yeah, I totally agree. I, I'm going to pull up another, another uh, comment from the chat uh, from secure into Yahoo. Uh, how does Keon being a legit rotational piece at that price, hope the Kings moving forward. How much do the Kings need to move in salary to pay Malik? whatever it, he needs. Um, I, this is a complex question. And I actually, I did a little bit of research earlier today. Um, it's like almost impossible to clear up more space for Malik Monk. Just got to be honest, like without yeah, just, just flat out giving, the luxury tax. Well, no, I mean, there's, there's only a certain amount you can pay him. Right. Like, but I'm saying, yeah. 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 I mean, not being afraid of the luxury tax is one thing. And that's something that Vivek needs to step up and, and take care of, right? That's going to be uh, something that we'll basically see how that works out. If, if Vivek does, the Kings right now are 22nd in the league in, in salary. And I've always been of the opinion, like, look, they're, they're in a position where they can strike if they need to, but they also know that they have De'Aaron Fox about to hit like a massive payday. And then Keegan Murray is going to be due his extension in two years. And then you got to worry about Monk. Just to reiterate what, what I've talked about like a bunch of times, whether it's here or on the insiders, the only thing the Kings can do, the most money they can offer Malik Monk because he only signed a two-year contract is an early bird extension 
it starts at like $17.4 million in year one, goes up to 18 point something. The, you can give them a four year, like $78 million contract. The problem with the early bird is that it's a mandatory two year contract. So you can't do like a one and one and have him opt out. And then all of a sudden he's got three years worth of service with the same team, which would give him his standard Larry bird rights. And then you could pay him whatever you want. So if Malik is going to do an early bird deal with the Kings, it'll have to be like a two year. I mean, he can get a four year, $78 million deal, but an opt out after year two, and then he could go back in and renegotiate a bigger deal with the Kings right. going forward. So it's a little complex. My point was like the only way for the Kings to clear cap space would literally be to just start handing away players for nothing. And it wouldn't just be like one, it would have to be like three or four players. And that's, it would get dicey because they're at like, I think for next season, they're at 152 million, which means they're already going to be projected at like 10 million over the cap. So in order to even get to where Malik Monk is, they would have to shave like almost, you know, to get to the 17.4 million, they'd have to shave like, 27 million off the cap just to get to that point so that's when you're you start talking about like they'd have to give away kevin herter at 17 million bucks they'd have to find takers for chris duarte at 6 million and davion mitchell at 6 million and even then you're at 29 million and that that doesn't really help you because you also in that transaction you lose your mid-level exception you 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 lose your biannual exception like you lose all of these other options for for bringing in better players so it would be nearly impossible for the kings to do without them touching like the De'Aaron foxes or or demonis bonuses of the world which i don't think that they're going to do um but either way where are you guys at with what we're seeing here because i mean the question is a good one. Like it, it helps the Kings a lot that, that you now have a player who looks like a rotational player who they just locked up for a three-year contract at a minimum scale. Like Keon Ellis makes nothing. He makes nothing at all moving. Like, I think he'll make like two, maybe 2 million next year. And then like 2.2 and 2.3, like the two years after that, it's, it's realistically, this is how you have to build a team if you're going to be successful. Yeah. And to me, when it comes to Malik, it's whatever it takes. Um, he's that important to what this team is, especially with Fox and Sabonis. Um, with Keon, it's just they're they're super lucky that they were able to elevate this guy from a two way contract to the contract he currently has. Um, you know, I would still say it, warn people it's small sample size. You know, it, we could a month a month from now we could be talking about something completely different when it as it pertains to Keon Ellis. Although I don't think that we will. I really don't think that we will. You say Keon Purdy? Yeah, Keon Purdy. Yeah. He's basically that's, the the king's equivalent of, yeah. That's uh pump the brakes a little bit, but maybe. Just just maybe. <laughs> yeah. Another guy it makes me think of, which this is also a pump the brakes, but is Lou Dort. Like they found Lou Dort undrafted. Yeah. Um, and similarly, he got a long deal that was small um annually, and it's worked out really well for OKC again. Not saying Keon's going to be Lou Dort or Alex Caruso, but there are really good undrafted stories. Give you another one, Gabe Vincent. Gabe, Gabe Vincent, Vincent, absolutely. You know, especially with Miami, what he meant for Miami. Um, and then, you know, especially when they bring in a guy like Kyle Lowry and still Gabe ends up starting now. He's been, he got paid, went to the Lakers, and he hasn't been able to play yet. So, uh, because of injury. So, just to, there's Tory Craig, there's Royce O'Neal, yeah. there's there's a lot of dudes um, that fits into that. And but the Malik conversation, Orlando's the team I worry about. I think they can definitely offer a a bigger deal in there. And Malik's going to be one of the most intriguing guards out there. Now maybe that's not the direction they want to go, but you know if you're looking at your options of say Clay Thompson, D'Angelo Russell, Demar Derozan, Malik Monk, there's a world where Malik could be the most intriguing to some teams. Yeah. And at 26, he, you know, he's about to enter his prime. Like uh, Malik Monk has a lot of incredible basketball in, ahead of him and he just keeps getting better. Uh, the other, the other team I think would be a really, is probably going to be someone who goes after, after him pretty solidly is the Toronto Raptors who, from what I've heard, tried to sneak him into a potential Pascal Siakam deal. 
And uh, again, they I think they're at ninety three million dollars in cap space. Uh, uh, well, ninety three million dollars used as of right now, which puts them like close to fifty million dollars in cap space this summer. So they're going to be a team that uh, that becomes like I, I would assume someone who's interested in him. Um, and you know, I, I think we we talked to Malik last night, and like Malik is like he's such a breath of fresh air. Um, like we've talked about this before. He he literally tells us all to. F off all the time. Um, and it's all in he's fun. Kidding. He's yeah, no, he is. He's just kidding. He's just yeah. like, he's trying to break the ice and just trying to be funny and just trying to like keep things loose and light. Um, but he also like, he started talking about sort of how much, I don't know if you guys saw him on NBC. He, he was saying like how much, you know, Mike Brown has put faith in him and that Monty McNair put faith in him and Wes Wilcox put faith in him. And I, I do think he he believes that Sacramento is is probably one of the right places for him in the league. And, you know, it's going to be tough for someone else to come in. And it, it's not it's not just going to be about money, but we're also talking about a player who has not been paid the same way that some of players from his draft have been paid. And like, sure, he's made 20 million bucks over the last two years, but he didn't make a lot before that. And so. I wouldn't be surprised if Malik gives, you know, everyone uh, the opportunity to come at him. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, how much more is he going to get than the, than the two year, $35 million deal or $36 million deal that the Kings can offer. And, uh, and will they make promises of giving to give him a lot more money after that? Uh, which, you know, is something that you could al also see. I think he can position himself well. I don't think any organization looks two years ahead and says, you know, we're going to promise you money necessarily. But um, if things trend the way that they are, he'd be in line for an absolute major payday. Um, mm -hmm. But I also wouldn't blame him for going out there to find it to, to, to secure the money. I mean, I think securing to Yahoo in our chat is usually securing to bag, if I remember correctly. Securing the bagley. Yeah. So. I would think he'd go out and secure that bag. Yeah. I'm, like really, he feels like a tough evaluation because there's nights where he looks like an all-star and then other nights where he does kind of get quiet. You know, there, he, he is still a fairly inconsistent player. I think when it comes down to it right now, and I think he's gotten better. Like he has 24 games this year with 20 plus. One of them was that last game. Kings are 18 and six in those games. Um, I don't know. There's times he looks like an all-star and other times that I think he's quiet out there. So I kind of feel like the range that Sacramento can get to that 478 ish, as you kind of laid out, James, I think it's reasonable. I think there's a world where maybe it doesn't even take that much. And I think there's also a world where Orlando comes in or Toronto and, uh, and decides to give him more. I, I feel like there's such a wide range. I get, I get what you're saying. I, I'd also say, you know, like you start seeing stats. I saw a stat today that said, um, Malik Monk has 17 games this season where he's 15 points and five assists, right? And that sounds like a big number. And they said the only player to ever do that is Lou Williams. And I went and looked at Lou Williams, and and I think it, Lou Williams is a great player comp for for Malik Monk. The the question is whether Malik Monk thinks he's De'Aaron Fox or whether he he now believes he's Lou Williams. And so the difference is whether he's a starter or he's coming off the bench for the rest of his career. And um, Lou Williams, like in his two of his prime years, I didn't look at all of his years because I'm like, OK, that seems like a weird stat because they didn't say how many times Lou Williams did it. And one time it was like 42 times. And another time it was like 38 times that Lou Williams did that in in a season, not like for his career. Like he he broke those the He put up those types of numbers like consistently. He was consistently great. And I'd also bring it back to what. Monk said about like now teams can't just defend two players. They have to defend a third. And I, I think that's the really the true thing where Malik, he has to be able to understand the dynamics of basketball and that the fact that he gets all of these opportunities as a guy coming off the bench, it's still huge for him. He's getting all kinds of opportunities that a lot of starting shooting guards don't get in the league because they play alongside a guy who's like De'Aaron Fox, who shoots a ton. And it's really hard to balance out. And I don't I don't know that starting versus coming off the bench is going to be Doesn't as matter. big a deal as it's going to be money. 
he needs to be in a position to score the basketball as much as possible. And I'll just give you some numbers here real quickly. I mean, you guys know my feelings. I'm, I always sound like I'm such a Malik Monk first team, all, all team, like Malik Monk fan um, because of what he means to this team. Don't turn the ball over. Just don't turn the ball over. That's his, that, I don't care if he doesn't score well, but it, here's my thing. Don't turn the ball over. But when he does score, there's been 24 instances this year where he's scored 20 points or more. They've won 18 of those games. Mm -hmm. That's how crucial he is to the success of the Sacramento Kings. And if you go back and look last year, it's up there. So uh, he is undeniably their best, their third best player. And it's not even close. Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, I think it's going to be one of the more difficult things because like, I don't think in a perfect world he wants to leave, but he has to do what's right for him and do what's right for his family. I'd say that one other thing that actually might play in in the Kings' favor, which is kind of a weird thing, but Malik Monk has become obsessed with golf, and Sacramento has a great golf season and a ton of really nice golf courses, and there are players here that would you know that he can go out and play with. There are people here that he'll be playing with nonstop, and he is becoming like more and more and more of like a golf guy. Um, you know, and, and like, look, good weather does he's also matter. A country dude. He's also a country dude. Dude goes out there and does a lot of stuff in the sticks and you got a lot of options when you live in Sacramento. Yeah. Um, hmm. if, if he were to walk, you think it's mainly just the MLE you try to work with to try and replace some of that production, I guess, or like you work on the trade market. See, that's the problem, Brendan, that like I keep. I know when I start talking salary cap, some people just like turn off. The Kings are already yeah, at 150. I go cross-eyed sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, the Kings are already at like 151 million bucks for next season. And that's without Malik Monk, right? So here's the problem. They're already over the cap. So if you sign Malik Monk and you give him the 117.4 the million, you're, you're at 168, right? You still have your mid-level exception, which is going to be like 13 million bucks. So you still have the option to go out and and get somebody. If you lose Monk, you're still over the cap, and the only thing you have to replace him with is the mid level. So in a sense, if if you keep him, you can have two players a, that make roughly thirty million bucks. If you lose him, you're only going to have one spot at thirteen million bucks to that, to use. And it's really it's kind of crappy that that's how the the salary works but just because you lose somebody if you already are over the cap there's no changing that like you're you're screwed so the kings are gonna have to be aggressive in a lot of ways this summer but i don't think there's a way for them to clear up space to give malik monk more and i also like if you lose him it makes things really difficult on you so, so james I, what, what would be the what would be the kings if you're monty mcnair aside from his teammates and aside from coach and, and coaching staff and whatever things the city has to offer. If you're Monty McNair, what's your biggest advantage when you're going up against the likes of say Orlando or Toronto or teams that have more money? Well, I think Toronto is pretty easy. You just say, look, do you really want to play in, in Toronto? No, 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 like no. You... I'm saying, I'm saying from, from a contractual standpoint, take all that other shit aside money years. Yeah. What gives Sacramento advantage? The, the only thing that gives them an advantage is that they, they have an advantage over all the teams in the league that only have mid-level exceptions. Right. Right. So there are a bunch of teams in the league that are, there's probably going to be 20 teams in the league plus maybe 22 that literally have no cap space at all. And all they have is if they're a tax paying team, they, they have a taxpayer's mid-level, which is like 6 million. If they're below the tax, then they have like, all they have is a, uh, is the mid-level exception. So you instantly wipe out half the teams in the league or, or, or probably like 21, 22 teams in the league who can't offer even the 17.4 million that the Kings are offering. So that's where the Kings have an advantage. The other thing is that if someone else wants to come in, if they if they do have 17 million bucks in cap space, they can only, only offer him 5% raises every year where the Kings can offer 8% raises so that's part of being able to retain your own free agents is you get that extra little bit, which doesn't sound like that much, but 
like start doing 3% of, of, uh, like 17 million. I don't know. What is that? Like 500,000 bucks, uh, like a year. And then that compounds. Right. So, um, so it's the, the big advantage is that you can offer him more than any of the teams who only have middle levels. Correct. Yeah. Right. And you don't have any matching rights or anything else. The problem that the Kings realistically and have. And you're maxed is, out on your years, right? The, Cause it can only be, it can be four, but it's two with an option. Well, if right? you're Malik Monk, you're going to want two years with an option. Correct. Right. So the Kings could also uh, like, this is just getting deep in the weeds. They could also rescind the early bird rights to, to Malik and they could sign him at, at like an 8% raise of his current salary. So his current salary is, is 9.9 .9 million bucks. So let's just say they can, they can give him an 8% raise and he makes like basically 10.9, 10.8 million bucks, right. For one season. In once you get into that, so once you get to the end of that season, because he's been with you for three years, you now have full Larry Bird rights to him. And then you can go give him whatever. You can sign him to any money that you want up to uh, his years of service, which basically is like De'Aaron Fox money. Now, they're not going to give him De'Aaron Fox money. He's not getting, you know, when Fox gets his next deal, it's right. 50 million a year. He's not getting that kind of deal. Um, and he might only get like 25 million a year. Like that might be the difference between what we're talking about. I don't know what Malik's market value is, but like it's it's super complex when it comes to like how do you clear enough space? And if you lose him, now you're talking about like, okay, what do you do? Like now you, you not only have to try to find a small forward or a power forward, a long athletic three and D guy to, to you know, be your next generation like Harrison Barnes. Um, but you also need to find, you know, the next Malik Monk slash Bobby Jackson type player. And, and that's not easy. Like, like creating these guys is very difficult. And you just look at the lineage of, of Jeff Petrie, what he did, you know, he started with, uh, like John Barry and then Tony Delk and Vernon Maxwell. And then he stumbles upon Bobby Jackson because Vernon, because Tony Delk left and got like a major deal with the, the Phoenix Suns years ago. And then Bobby Jackson, they they took on because he it wasn't working out in Denver or whatever. They were able to land Bobby Jackson, and he becomes a spectacular player. At the same time, you know, he went out, uh, uh, Petrie, that is, went out and drafted Quincy Duby. He went out and drafted all of these other players trying to find another Bobby Jackson and never did the rest of his career. Like, uh, whether it's Jimmer or it's, like, just name that guy that he took a stab at. Kevin Martin becomes more of like a starting level guy. Like it's really tough to find these types of guys. And Monty McNair is, is kind of lucky that he found it with Malik. Malik was a starter with the Lakers, took a, a different role with the, with the Kings and boom, just blows up. So yeah, really it, it's complex. It's not easy to find these guys. Yeah. And Malik's case, I don't think that it'd be hard for me to imagine him wanting to take another shorter deal and bet on himself again you know, there's talk beginning of the year of his work ethic being great this year. Not that it was ever bad before, but just kind of on another level this year. I would guess that it being a contract year plays into that. And from Leak's perspective, it's like, do I want to do that all over again and continue to bet on myself? And he's talked about his perspective of being a guy that was almost out of the league during complications with Charlotte. I mean, I would it wouldn't be surprised if he's in a spot where he's trying to get, make what's probably going to be his most significant deal of his career maybe the next one as well but certainly definitely a date. big jump from where he's at yeah yeah certainly to date yeah this is his his cash in right and i mean he he's young enough though that taking a two-year deal and then cashing in at 28 it's actually better than cashing in at 26 because then it carries you to like you know again he'd have full larry bird rights the kings could sign him to up to a five-year extension right the when you get away from like the early bird, the early bird is going to be a four year max extension. The, the next contract that he would get if he waits it out for two years is up to a five year extension. Cause all those you're just straight a Larry bird, Larry bird rights, which means a team can go over the cap to sign you. And they can also give you a fifth year and do all that stuff. So if you, you plan it out, right, it would be good to get paid at 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, for your five-year deal, that would be probably really good. And, and you, he's going to get a whole lot of money. 
So either way, I, I mean, I think it's complex and it's, and it's tough. And I know Kings fans are very concerned about it. These things typically take care of themselves. Uh, you have the relationship with De'Aaron Fox and everything else. And I think it, it, it's, it's interesting because like the real question is, do you have somebody else that can fill his role? And but the answer is no. Like you drafted Colby Jones, and Colby Jones looks like a, a solid ball player and sort of a jack of all trades type of guy, but he doesn't have that dynamic score mentality that what we've seen out of Malik Monk. I think it's gonna be really, really tough to find somebody like that, even you know, if you went out of the free agent market. Like what yeah, if Bones definitely. Highland or someone like it's just tough, right? I mean, it's playmaking all that. I mean, it's there's there's so many intangibles, and not to mention, I mean, we talked about a minute ago chemistry in the locker room chemistry with this team giving them kind of an identity uh it's it's very very important yeah give him the iron fox someone that he can you know that he's super close to um what do you guys expect from this king's team over the next like this is they're in the middle of an eight great game stretch it started with memphis this is the biggest eight game stretch of of the season in my opinion the final eight games is like it's just going to be like a battle every night's going to be a battle this eight game stretch where again you start with memphis you play toronto so the kings play toronto tomorrow night uh because we're recording this late on tuesday toronto is sitting all five of their real players um well they're like quickly is not playing barnes is not playing rj barrett uh rj barrett like sending love to the the barrett family they had an, uh, an incredibly horrible tragedy this last week um, where RJ Barrett lost his, his brother, um, like with some random illness. I'm not even sure what happened there. Um, but, uh, Chris Boucher isn't playing. Oh, Yaka Pirtle's not playing like, so that's one game, but then you play Washington on the second night and then you got Orlando, which is solid, but not great. Who, and then who, by the know, way, didn't Washington just slip past Detroit as the worst team in the league? Hmm. Are they the best seven win team in the league, Sean Cunningham? <laughs> oh, I mean, look, I mean, I know we joke and this is these are the types of teams that you know can give the Kings fits, but um you mentioned the eight games. I'd look at these next three. I mean, look, Orlando's real is a decent team. I like I like Orlando. I like watching mm-hmm. them. They're kind of like a, a league pass personal favorite, but um I know it's a tough back to back with Toronto going through customs and you know playing Washington, but you have to sweep that. No, you do. Like if this eight games, you need to go, dare I say, six and two or seven and one. Like if you have a shot, if you don't if you want to avoid the plan, that's where you gotta be. Like there's no there's no like mistakes here. And two of those games against Dallas. And so that and Philadelphia, Philadelphia is not playing well at all right now without Embiid. They're having all kinds of struggles. Um, you know, Tobias Harris, who is like a notorious Kings killer, has not played well at all lately. So, like, I'm just Although, looking at this eight games. Like, it's it's tough. It, and then you finish that eight games with Utah. Embiid has returned to practice. Oh, do you think he'll be there on on Tuesday? I, I, I would probably bet against it, but. Uh... You know, maybe they get the big fella back in the next two weeks. Hmm. Intriguing. Yeah. So what do you guys make of this, Brennan? What do you got for us? Yeah, I think those three games that Sean pointed out um, definitely stand out to me, too. And I I feel weirdly confident in the Kings right now. Like that game against Memphis, they weren't hitting threes, but I thought that they were playing all right defensively for, for the most part in that game. There was the fouls that I think need to be cleaned up, but I've been pretty encouraged by how they've looked defensively and I think been able to survive some tougher shooting nights or they're giving themselves a little bit of leeway there where they don't have to be perfect offensively to still come out and win some games. So I think if the physicality stays there that I'm weirdly feeling good about it right now, but that's what always happens this year. Right. And then they have a stinker. So, but at the end of the day, I've talked, I said it like, I was like, you really feel like you should sweep those two teams and I get it. But at the end of the day, playing on the East coast, Playing back to back, I mean that's always we talk about is tough. I don't care how it's done, you just have to win two of these next three, at least. If you can do that, you're feeling pretty good. Um, you just take the bird's eye approach. I don't care if it's dropping Toronto, winning in Washington, and winning in Orlando. I don't care what sequence of events it is. Winning two of three is uh, on this trip is what it is. You hope you can split with Dallas. Uh, which you're going to have next week on the home and home with a couple days in between. 
who do they play in before that, James? Just talking about Philly, camp. Dallas, Dallas, Utah. Philly here, right? Yeah, Philly and Sacramento. Yeah, Philly, yeah. And Utah can give some battles, you know, as we've seen. So Yeah, I mean, man, I feel bad for uh for John Collins right about now. He's on Boy. he's on every poster in the world. Um also yeah. is uh I mean aside just just side note, I was watching um uh the Timberwolves earlier tonight. I mean, Anthony Edwards is low key just like kind of a troll. I mean Amazing dunk, all that stuff. We've we've seen some some great things, but uh, he's he's. I love watching him play to the crowd, kind of a la Pat Beverly or even um, Tony Allen. I mean, he's he's got kind of a, a charisma to him, and he and and certainly a, a a play it up and be a definitely be a, play the role of a heel like you would see in wrestling. Yeah, um, he's funny. I you yeah, know I enjoy I, it. I also I love that he injured his hand by dunking too hard and he didn't injure the hand that he hit the rim with because he but he threw the ball through the basket so hard that it hit his off hand down below and he had to leave the game because he injured his hand. So John Collins was bleeding and like I had a concussion, but Ant-Man throws the ball through the rim and hits his left hand with the ball and had to leave the game because he he threw it through the, the rim so so hard he he, uh, he bruised his hand. I think it's post game interview. So I was to say, sorry, his post like his post game interview for that game was elite. I did not catch that. I know he said he had to give his jersey to John Collins, which is funny. But what my favorite comment at on that dunk was, you know, it's a good dunk when both guys get injured. Oh, <laughs> that's hilarious. What did you like more, that comment or Leaky Black and Grady Dick uh, sharing jerseys, like swapping jerseys yeah, after a game? No, that one, I'm not going to lie. I was cracking up for a good 10, 20 minutes at that. It's it's the look on their faces that did it for me. Like, you could tell Grady has done this his whole life. Anthony Black went and got a cameraman, made sure he's standing on the right side. It was hilarious. That was Sean, you saw this, right? I did, but that was Anthony Black, right? Yeah, Anthony Black. Yeah, uh, yeah Leaky Black. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, is Leaky and Anthony Black the same? I don't no. think so. Oh, my bad. People. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I, I had to double check myself. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I thought I was tripping. Uh, I, I like how people are speculating, like, will you talk to Col- – will you exchange jerseys with Colby White or Kevin Love? <laughs> or, I mean, there's some wild ones out there. It is – I we thought it like was – Bruce Brown checking in the other day. I, I thought it was – pretty uh hilarious in the sense that it came from the players and they clearly knew what they were doing having fun at their own ex- you know um i think it's something that grady dick has had to go through his whole life um but at the same time i think the or did i read this right maybe someone in the chat might know but did the orlando social media person get fired for that which i think is just absolutely despicable i think there um, might have been speculation that there was an opening and that led to that. I hope that's not. True. I don't know. I do. Be, I did see the comments. Crappy. I did see the comments um, from from Grady Dick today at practice. I think it was practice today, um, where a reporter asked him about it. And he says, "Yeah, it's my guy." And you can clearly see that you know he was amused <laughs> by the question. And he's like, the, the reporter asked if he had other other ones to. to We're gonna come need on. that one. Don't we need yeah. that one for sure. Um, where he was asked if there were <laughs> any other planned Jersey swaps to possibly. And uh, yeah, man, I don't know. I think that might. I, Hey, stuff. like you, you have to laugh, right? Like sure. I, I remember like, again, where we sit, we're looking down over the visitors bench. And like, I remember uh, Rudy Gay and Kevin love lining up next to each other for a free throw attempt. And like, you just, it's like all of these things, you know, like, Hey, it's, it's funny. It is so. Um, I like watching Thomas. on the uh, like if Ball State was ever to play Sac State, and you look at the uh, abbreviations on the ESPN ticker, that would be amazing. <laughs> I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> James gets oh, jokes. He just got it. That's a good one. That's yeah. a good one. Uh, I was definitely bummed out to see my UC Davis Aggies falling in what is that tournament? I don't even know what that tournament is. That was West. the Big West Conference Big tournament West. where. Shout out Elijah Pepper, who was the conference player of the year. I think he's going to be a fun, fun player to watch. Uh, maybe a G-leaguer, certainly has a future in the Australian league, but I 
kind of want to see if he can maybe be like a Chima Moneki and have a moment in the NBA, but oh. um, he can certainly shoot. He's, he's pretty tremendous defensively. Just has, doesn't have a lot of size to him, but yeah, they, they, they had their heart broken in that tournament. It would have been nice to see them get in. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So um, Isaiah Thomas back in the NBA, uh, like I did not think that that would ever happen. Like absolutely amazing. 35 years old, um, signed a 10 day with the Phoenix suns. Um, you think he's going to get to play? I, I don't. I, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Cause I think that, I think there'll be moments where, you know, Phoenix is capable of blowing out a team. I don't know if it'll be meaningful minutes, but it would be kind of interesting to see what that looked like, especially on a team with Booker and Durant. Um, uh, look, this team doesn't have a lot of depth. And so maybe scoring off the bench, I mean, they've got, you know, a guy like Grayson Allen who can lead the league in threes. I think he still is the lead league, league leader in threes. Um, but they just don't have a ton of depth. And on that team, you get to a guy who's kind of playoff tested, maybe bring, brings a little bit of experience for a lot of those guys that don't. I don't know, maybe, but I, I don't know that he'll play any meaningful minutes. I just hope he can make the uh, final roster throughout the playoffs and, and still see him at least be on the an ever present uh presence on the bench and in practice yeah definitely rooting for him he's one of my that isaiah thomas celtics years are some of my favorite basketball teams um but i kind of think that jordan goodwin does what isaiah thomas does and has kind of already been on that team and it, it's just a little weird fit wise to me i think that there has been a lot made about phoenix needing a point guard but i think typically it's more of a distributor a typical distributor and it doesn't really quite fit into that so i'm interested to see how he gets used but i you know not the most optimistic about him getting a lot of minutes or anything yeah they put him in the g league in utah and he roasted everybody yeah i think he averaged 33 a game over four games yeah. and like, look as an off ball shooter like man that dude's a knockdown bucket like he can, he can really score somebody else. Yeah, uh, think, think also uh, just about the experience. I mean, Frank Vogel, I think has prior experience with him with, with LA even briefly. Um, hmm. I, I just think the experience alone will, will, will benefit that team, whether he's playing or not. I just think, I mean, I know Vogel talked about that recently, but um, if he can buy in and just be a solid productive player and don't go out there and try to chuck, I think it would help them. Yeah. No, I think so too. And I don't think he's going to try to chuck. I think he's going to try to fit in. He's going to try to be a good teammate and, and right. try to stay as long as possible. Uh, somebody did ask in the chat, if you guys have any questions, throw them in the chat right now. Cause we'll get to that in just a sec. But somebody put to, if Lyles and Sasha are injured, then bring up scowl from Stockton. Uh, if herders injured, bring up Daniel house, um, sign Daniel for, house. You, you can't do either one of those yeah. things. The Kings have 15 rostered players. So the only way to do that would be to waive somebody, whether it be like a Kessler Edwards or somebody. And to be honest, like that would be tough. You you have somebody who's been with you the whole year. And what are you going to actually get out of a player? Um, and again, that's coming from someone who absolutely adores Scal Abies here. Scal is one of my favorite uh, players that I've ever covered. He's just, just one of the sweetest kids you're ever going to run into. And he's been really good for Stockton. Um, but that doesn't mean that there's a roster spot in Sacramento. The right. Kings took that roster spot and rightfully so gave it to uh, Keon Ellis after after the trade deadline uh, because he had ran out of games. There's also something weird. I, I have to do more research on this, but um, why am I doing Mason Jones. Mason Jones mm -hmm. mentioned in the locker room that he can only – play in nine more games this season that he's he can only of, dress for it he can only dress and i don't know why that is i need to do more research because he hasn't been a two-way contract guy who's played a bunch of games for other teams that i could see this year um but uh it has to do with the kings only having a total of 150 games uh for g league players to to suit up and um and so he's running out of games and i don't i don't know how that's possible because uh jordan ford and jalen slauson didn't play that many games i know that keon they basically maxed he played 49 or 50 games so he ate up one of those spots but uh I, there must be some sort of like i think it has to do with be becoming a two-way player in the middle of the season hmm. and, and then it goes against whatever your 
whatever you've your allotment of G League um, transactions or something. It's got to be something like that. Yeah, yeah. It's it's weird. I, I don't know. Like I need to I need to sit down with somebody and ask the question. Uh, people are asking about Sasha. Sasha is nearing a return. He is questionable for tomorrow. It is possible he plays. Um, he has practice because we heard. Like, I don't know. They shoot, shoot around. He went through his first full shoot around, which was the first time yesterday before the game. He had come out and done a lot of individual work, but wasn't able to practice prior to that. So the shoot around was his first full participant, which was uh, Monday before the game. And now is the first time you've seen him since February 11th when he suffered his injury be listed anything other than out. So he's now questionable. If he goes through, um, a shoot around tomorrow. I, they they may have been able to. I don't think they practiced today. They flew, had to go to Toronto. Um, don't think there's anything that happened there. I know they flew at like ten in the morning, so certainly no practice before leaving Sacramento. Uh, but yeah, if he has a shoot around tomorrow, my guess is, especially with the back to back, that he probably won't play on Wednesday. And then you, if there's a greater chance, you might see him on Thursday. Hmm. Um. Yeah, that would be good. Kings could use him. Um. Let's see. Spencer, you mentioned Mason Jones came in a trade. He came in a G League trade, but he wasn't a two-way player. And the only way to be active on the main roster is to be a two-way player. Uh, he had played a couple games overseas when the Kings traded for him. He was on an overseas team. Yeah, but that doesn't. That's not going to affect his, his right. G League's his yeah his status. I again, I don't know how many games that um, that Jordan Ford and. Uh, Jalen Slauson have been active. I know they haven't played. I think Jalen Slauson's played in like six games and, and Jordan Ford's played in like five. So, but how many games they're active for is a, is a question because people forget early in the season that uh, the Kings had uh, Alex Len and uh, like at one point, Trey Lyles missed the first 13, but then Alex Len missed a couple of games and then De'Aaron Fox missed a couple of games. So he missed, I think five. So in during those games, all of their two way players were active and they were sort of like, like eating up all of the two way, uh, the, the two way games, because you only get 150 games in a year. So unless uh, you have a 14 man roster, which then it drops to like. Oh, thought it would be me. So did I. I'm back. You're back. There he is. Um, uh, Brennan, you want to explain this one? Explaining what kind of contract that Kobe has. Um, you know, honestly, off the top of my head, I'd have to pull this one up again. But um, it, he's, I, I think, just pro progress this year, I think, very much reminds me of what they did with Keon. Um, it's a four-year rookie deal that they put him on. But since he was a second rounder, it's not. You know, there's no preset. This is the deal you're getting. Um, so what they ended up agreeing on four years, 8.7, about 8.8 .8 million, um, which could potentially put you in a similar conversation of what we were talking about of, of Keon earlier. You know, again, I think that he's following a very similar route. We're pretty much going to fully have you deal with Stockton this year. There's progress attempting to be made when it comes to him being a point guard. Um, so you know, one of those that could potentially be a good deal down the line, but still very TBD. But only half of it was guaranteed, right? If I yeah, remember it's a, correctly. Like Ben put it out, it's a two plus one plus one. Right. So it, it's a standard. Um, okay, so the NBA made a new exception for second round picks this year because you, in order to give a second round pick a, a, a four-year contract, you would have to either have cap space or carve it out of one of your exceptions before this season. So again, a, a normal second round pick, if you had no cap space and you have no exceptions, you're only able to give them a two year contract. And then you would still have rights to them after that. They'd be restricted free agents, but they're restricted free agents. that can get more money. The NBA as part of like some of their CBA negotiations this year added a, another second round pick exception, which means you can basically give a second round pick. What is sort of like a, a first round pick con uh, like contractually, like a, it's a two year guaranteed, although partially one of the years can be partially. And then the final two years are full team options on, on money. So 
Yeah, and then, uh, like Ben said, Ke- uh, Keon got a, a 2 plus 1. The reason why Keon got a 2 plus 1 is because Keon already played for a season, even though it was at the G League level, and he was a two-way contract last year. You're still you're going to have other weird contractual rights for with him. And I believe his year, his deal is a two plus one after this year. I might be wrong. So either way, it takes it takes him up to like when he's going to be a restricted free agent. If he if it's within his first four or five years of his career, he's still going to be a restricted free agent, which means the Kings can if they extend a qualifying offer, they can match any offer to him. Um, is okay. that two point one next year, and then the club option would be on twenty five, twenty six for two point three. Okay, okay, and then also because you have that three years, that also give you gives you full Larry Bird rights to him. So it's, I mean, these are all like weird contractual things. Uh, do you guys have any other questions uh, here in the chat? Like, sorry for those of you who are listening to this on the second day, um, but we do have uh, plenty of people in the chat tonight. And if you guys don't mind. Uh, and you're still in here. We still have like 183 people in here. Give us a thumbs up. It'd be awesome. How did you do that? I, I don't know. Every time I do that, time. it gives a thumbs up. I, I, it's cool. I don't know. It's weird. It's a little bubble. I think it's only me that can do it. How many do we have already? Likes? I don't know. Like, uh, Brandon can look. I can you don't look. have to love us. Just like us. <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So, 74. Uh, then, what's that? 74. Sorry. You know, okay. Happened. That's good. Uh, ben, Ben brings up too. interesting thing with Monk is he took less than the MLE. If he took the, the MLE, he could have got 20 million in extension first year. I'm not sure that that's like, okay. So the fact that he only took a two year MLE was, was sort of the deal. That's like when you only take a two year deal, uh, even if he would have had a third year option, it would have given the Kings more wiggle room, but they didn't do that. Um, and just so people know when they gave Malik Monk, the MLE, this goes back to what we were just talking about when they gave, they gave him like 9.4 something million bucks the first year. What they did is they carved out a, a rookie scale $1.64 million contract out of the MLE. And that's what they're trying to get Sasha to sign the first year. And that's because they could have given him a four-year deal with that MLE as a un, as a second-round pick, a former second-round pick. So it's before this whole second-round pick exception that we just talked about. They took uh, like a the MLE was at uh, it was like eleven point something million bucks, and they carved out like a little one point six four million dollar rookie scale uh, contract that they could extend and give a four-year deal. And they tried to get Sasha to sign, which would have been like four years at like almost seven million bucks. And he turned it down, rightfully so, because then he ended up getting a three year, 20 million bucks and 19 million dollar deal. So, yeah, it's just kind of weird. So, and like Ben says, he can get because he makes nine point nine million dollars this year. The Kings can pay him up to 175 percent of his original contract. So 17.4 million, which is why I keep saying that number. And then he can have 8% raises on top of that every year. So, uh, Hmm. cool. All right. Uh, We, uh, here's a good question. We'll take this one from Johnny Z4. Who is the best interview on the team? Mike Brown, if he counts. Okay. Um, I'm going to go Malik Monk. Yeah, that's the one. And uh, if I had to pick a second, my second might actually surprise you guys. Oh, don't want you guys go go with your first, and I'll come with my second after you guys go. Okay, so Domas at the podium is one of my favorite interviews. Domas in a scrum, uh, he doesn't like being surrounded by people, and he gives short answers. <laughs> I, you it? get a much better answer from Domas at the that? podium. That what's that? Has he told you that? No, but you can tell. Like, look at, go back and watch. You can see his answers in the scrum, whether it's around his locker or at the practice facility versus his answers at the podium. It's totally different. Like, he he talks Mm -hmm. twice as long every single time. Um, I don't know. I I love talking to Trey Lyles. Um, Like, he's cool. Uh, Harrison Barnes has always been fun to interview. He's a good dude. Uh, I don't know. Darren, when he's... 
you know, you it, you can get two different kind of post game De'Aaron's specifically if that's what I'm mm-hmm. thinking of. But when he's good, he's very good. I think Fox is better at practice, and especially when you can bounce off different topics outside of the game. Oh. Um, I think he's really. Uh, I love it when he's feisty. I love it when he's um, when, when he's kind of musing about things that are happening around the league. Uh, I, I think he really excels in those moments for sure. Yeah, and when he starts dropping profanity, that's usually when he's at his best. Fox. <laughs> no, I mean well, really, it's when he's kind of he's relaxed and he's like, "Hey, this is fun." Um, worst interview. Um, I, you know, to be honest, I they don't really have yeah. a bad interview this year. On um, the team this year, is that no? I'm just saying, was it like ever, or was it like? Are they talking about the worst interview in the locker room now? No, I mean last year there was there was only one clear player that was very very difficult to interview. Is this uh, Casey Apala? Yes. Yeah, that was yeah. rough. <laughs> that was that was rough. I, and like over the years, I've covered plenty of weird athletes that like. I mean, Terrence he's not Williams. Weird. He just, he's not no, weird. No, yeah, he yeah, yeah. He wasn't like, weird. Play the part. He Casey's doesn't want to very talk. bright. No, like if yeah. you went to Stanford. Yeah. I mean, if you talk to him, I mean, he, you can get there. I just don't think he enjoys the, the media game for sure. The, the, my second, quote, my second, by the, the way, was it was Fox, but it, 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 it's starting to get some pressure there because if you have some conversations with Mason Jones, it is very entertaining. He is fun. I like Mason. Yeah. I also like Alex Len is a, a natural talker. And, and, you know, again, he's Ukrainian. There's a little, no, I don't want to say language barrier as much as there is just, you know, like enunciations and, and like him going through it. Like, again, like we dealt with this with Bogey, the whole, we've told this story about Bogey didn't understand what snowballed means. Um, like there's a little bit of that with, with Alex, but not nearly as much. Um, but he's also quiet and doesn't give you a ton and we don't interview him a lot. So that's probably it too. He hasn't been interviewed a lot, probably since he was looking, uh, since he was a rookie. I mean, that um, exists we, way more with Crystal Arte than anyone else. Uh, Ralph says we are the laziest podcasters in Sacramento. Nice. He's right. No, he's right. Okay. Ralph, don't worry, <laughs> don't worry about it. We used to be two a week. Now we're only doing like one lately. Yeah. We are definitely in there. I'm not, I'll take that L that's up. That's on us. <laughs> Uh, or unless there was a question. Oh, there was a question mark. Is it maybe he was asking us who it's definitely us. Oh, there are no. people out there that do it every single fucking us. day. Are you kidding me? Well, that, that no, 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 no. I, I think when you talk about just like the sheer volume of podcasts, sure. We don't do as many, but number one, our podcasts are usually way longer than a lot of people's. And number two, <laughs> we all have multiple jobs that we do. Like, so, like on, that's but, not but, everybody. Like, but in terms of like, this because of all the stuff that we do this is we like not to say we don't put effort into this podcast we do but like we, we can just turn it <laughs> on and talk you know what i mean let's just be honest i'm not oh, no, gonna no, say we that can. we do we can a whole lot of talk. fucking prep we go and we just go you know what i mean and to be honest i'm not saying that that's always a bad thing like i think that's can be incredibly refreshing a lot of the podcasts i listen to have very little prep to it and i'm talking about like even in the comedy and entertainment fields and like some of the best ones like i know look you think about this like smartless is like one of the most popular podcasts that have ever existed maybe next to like in of in recent memory i know rogan is out there and it has a is like immensely popular but the whole premise of smartless is if there's three of us and let's say i'm the will arnett to you guys bateman whatever i'm bringing somebody on that you literally have no idea who i'm bringing on and then you just you're at your mercy to hopefully get to wikipedia to ask a a question or something like that so i actually really like the spontaneity of podcasts so you know there's always a thing of in radio where it's like nope save it for the show save it for the show i don't want to talk offline i don't want to talk you know talk about what we're going to talk about or have a piece of paper with a rundown just let's go let's just let it go and we'll, and we know the few things we want to get to but spontaneity is key to in my opinion the best type of radio or podcast so i don't know if the fans would agree with that or the people in the chat would agree with that but that's what no I, I mean we meander and we have but we have an idea of where we're going the whole entire podcast we, we just don't like when i have my radio show with kyle on uh espn 1320 it's very it's not scripted but like we have a a rundown right 
that we we try to follow. And even when Sean came in, you're like, we're not getting to all this. And I kept <laughs> us on. And like, sure enough, we got to the whole rundown, didn't we? Right. Yeah. We did. So oh, fine. It was and it was, you know, it was fine. It, I look at that and I'm like, tear this, tear, tear this off. We're moving. Well, on. yeah, but there's breaks <laughs> and there's all of these things that are mentioned, right? There, there are all of these things that are like you have to build into a show. There we have to go in and out of breaks and and all that stuff. So we have like elements we have to fill and all that. Stuff. A podcast is different. And so I, I think it's cool that we're able to just sit here and hang out, especially, I mean, it's late at night, it's 10 20 and we got a hundred almost 200 people in here. And, and, uh, and how long did, how long did we go? Hey, we're, we plan, how long did we plan on going live? Because it was literally like, Hey, should we go live? Like five minutes. Yeah. From the start. Five we, minutes we posted before. it right before. Yeah. That's, and I will, I will take this one on me because I've talked to Sean about this. It's been very difficult for me to schedule anything this year because of like the radio show. And to be honest, like many times it's been exhaustion. Yeah, like no lies. You it's know, all your fault. We get it. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. Like, <laughs> like last week, you know, like we had the back to backs, right? those were back to back 15 or 16 hour days. And then I had to be up the next day for a radio show at eight o'clock in the morning. And like, so like Brent, these things start to compound start playing a violin real quick. No, I'm just saying like, I, I <laughs> so, and, and we'll bring this up because it's something that happened this week. Sean, um, Sean was at practice on Sunday and I didn't go to practice. And, uh, Benny is right. Yeah. Mike Brown called me out for being a, a lazy bum. You um, weren't a lazy bum. No, I, I hadn't had a, and Mike was just being funny and I, I'm totally a okay with it. I hadn't had a day off in probably like three weeks at that point. And so I'm like, look, uh, it's a Sunday. I ended up writing the key on Ella's story. So it's not like James I took the day you off. You live in Nevada. You know where Brendan lives down the street. Oh, Did relax. he show up? Okay. No, he no, used he to. <laughs> it's 30 minutes now. All right. Yeah. You oh, weren't there either, Brendan. Nope. I was not. It was St. Patrick's day. I believe my memory serves me. Correct. Did you have green beer? I enjoyed St. Patrick's Day. Good for you. Okay. Yeah. And I, and I want to point out too that like the the Mike Brown thing, like it's fun that we have that exchange. But um I I played that video here in the house, uh like when it happened, like right after Sean posted it. I played it for my wife and my son. My little dude was out snowboarding. My 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 oldest was here with my wife and I. And so I played the video. We all had a good laugh. And my son, who is snarky as hell and a basketball oh, aficionado, he popped off and said, uh, let's see. He, he said, tell Mike, I'll show up when the screen does. Because it was the day after the Knicks game. Which was hilarious. Because that's, that's of course, Keon Ellis was waiting for the screen to come. And it never came. And so I resp I sent that to Mike and then we went back and forth and we had a good time with it. And then Mike gave my son a shout out uh, in pregame uh, yesterday. So, which is cool for a 20 year old. If you're you and all your buddies are basketball fans and head coach, call, you know, mentions you by name on, on pregame. Uh, so yeah, there's no, like no one's angry at anybody. I, I don't get angry at any of this stuff. Um, what do we got? Uh, Brandon, what movies are you watching lately? I've not mm. watched any movies people. Really? absolutely none no didn't you claim go out to, to make the a movie theater just get a some dune popcorn to get a, but let's get a nap oh um, just some just some popcorn the dune popcorn looks interesting oh the dune popcorn have you seen this show? all i got i have, yeah we've been I over have, this i have sorry i have seen that, that yes is wild. We've been over this. that is that is wild um yeah. yeah, it's not quite the same as the Taylor Swift bucket or whatever that is, which I did get and I haven't even seen it yet. I do have one. Maybe I'll put it on eBay. Would it make any money? I don't know. I have seen I a lot of clips recently of that um, Patriots documentary that you were talking about before. Oh, dude, it's fantastic. It, it, I'm not even a Patriots fan, but like having even Bill Belichick sit there as if he's like on the Hannibal Lecter gurney without the mask and, and practically have a gun to his head to try to answer some of these questions was brilliant. I mean, the participation was good. I think you'll, no matter if you like the Patriots or not, I think you'll watch that on Apple TV and be absolutely captivated by it. I think it's really, really good. Hmm. Can uh, I ask also the chat, by the way, how many people, sorry to interrupt you, James, how yep. many people have seen similar amount of movies to me? Cause I know I'm not alone here. Well, what do you mean? Similar? I'm like, not that. Like I'm not as alone none? as you think. I'm not. Yeah. I mean, like next to none. I yes. know Deuce is like Deuce. Deuce. Deuce Mason does not watch movies. 
And Wes Wilcox doesn't watch movies, but Monty McNair does and makes him fun of Wes all the time like we make him fun of right. Brendan. There's yeah. dozens of us, guys. I promise. There's there's dozens of you, you guys are like you're like the never nudes. You're you're the movie sorry, equivalent the of the never nudes. What is that? Um, Arrested, Arrested Development. Development. I got that one. Oh, see, I've never seen it. Yes. Oh man. Nice. So bias Fuquay, he he won't ever be nude. He always has jean shorts on his clothes. He even showers in jorts. jean shorts. Jorts. Yeah. Yeah, like cutoffs. Wow. Brendan did I get haven't it. Sean seen, did. Uh, I have not seen a movie in a little bit, to be honest. I did like the Oscars. <laughs> I mean, the Oscars were entertaining. Did, okay. you hadn't, and we went through it. Brendan had seen a couple of those, and then he was going to watch. Was it Holdovers you still haven't seen? I think no, you definitely Holdovers. haven't seen it. I don't remember talking about this one I, either. I want to see that. I want to like, I'm going to go through and watch a bunch of these movies. I did watch the, what was it? Pretty Things? Is that what it was? No, yeah, it's it's yeah, pretty little things. Pretty little thing. Yeah, you didn't really tell me that that was like NC seventeen. It's like not. It wasn't. No. No. Okay. It's it's fine. <laughs> I, I was like, like, oh wow. Oh, I, that's what I, it was. We thought. De- oh, the Emma Devin. Stone. Yeah. Yeah. We were gonna watch it. Yes. Yes. So that was one Lover of those and things. Friends where in you're Vegas. Like, I Johnny Z asked me if I'm going to Lover and Friends in Vegas. That's a festival. Um undecided i'm waiting to see the life is beautiful festival uh lineup which i have not seen yet i think that's due out any day so i'm gonna wait for that one first okay so we'll be we gotta wrap this thing up we gotta wrap this i have it i have a show to do in the morning um (laughs) devin when do i get good sacramento kings ticket deals i get a corporate deal that i see like yeah like Maybe I do have like some deals, but they're not like outlandishly good. And tickets are hit very, James up for your tickets expensive. now. Email James <laughs> yeah. for your tickets right away. Yeah, like I, tickets are going to sell fast too. And I certainly am not getting any deals for playoff tickets. I my son spent I think eight hundred bucks on two tickets last year for playoffs, um, and him and my wife went. Uh, okay, let's wrap this thing up. Um, we didn't do a business of basketball. That's okay. Uh, we'll just say it. The business of basketball. Da-na-na, um, da-na-na. What was the other one? <laughs> what? Wait, you just <laughs> you got it. Just take your pick. Take your pick. <laughs> Those are the only two. Oh, I get yeah, absolutely we'll ridiculous. Okay. Um, we should. Uh, okay, we should watch the. No, I, I, we should watch the bad doctor. No, I, Lewis. What are you trying to have us? Like, turn on here. No, we're not doing... Okay. This is my friend. Ignore him. Ignore him. Huh. Oh, got it. Got it. Uh, sweet. Um, okay, let's let's hit this. What do we got? Final thoughts. What do we got? Uh, we will start with Sean, because he does not look prepared for it. I'm, I am. I'm actually majorly prepared. Had a few hours. Just not even that. Because I've been working a lot, went out on a Friday night, looking forward to it. Had a big group of people. Oh, don't do this to me, Sean. I saw our buddy for about twenty minutes. <laughs> He'd had a little too much evening. Oh, well, not too much oh. evening. I was fine. I was just ready to go home. <laughs> oh, and I, yeah, and I did not say bye to anybody on my way out. I was ready to get out of there. It wasn't. No, no, no. See, this is. It was not an Irish goodbye because you did say goodbye, and this is shows how absolutely intoxicated or that you don't remember <laughs> so uh i i can't imagine what your saint patrick's day was like um but it started off your saint patrick's day weekend started off with a bang it was a little eye-opening a little disappointing um but ready to re- you 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 get a chance to redeem yourself i think you're so okay. lame for that you're so lame for that why <laughs> oh, it's all, it's all of love. whatever it's okay. I didn't know we'd tell stories. It's okay. Oh. I remember this, Sean. Uh, do, you, okay. do you have a story you want to tell no, about Sean? No, no, no. no. It's okay, I mean, we'll get a We'll get a uh, Sean story eventually. First of all, I'm a savage. You know this. <laughs> you savage. know this. Why'd you say it like that? This is because why everyone stays up late. Weird. I'm a savage. <laughs> because as you know, like there's not many God. people that are going to out hang me. You know what I mean? Like when it comes to the, yeah. the hangout crowd... Oh, I know. Good luck. Good luck. I I, I turned pro long ago. Hall of you Famer know, like, in this in this the, the part yeah, of the movie too. that you that your parents come in on. This is the part of the podcast that somebody's <laughs> parents walked in and Sean's just like, I'm a savage. I'm yep. a savage. Like <laughs> just hear the the Wilcox kids. 
Oh. <laughs> Daddy West, what does savage mean? <laughs> yeah, Sean, explain that one. Ridiculous. That'd be great. Okay, Brendan, you have any final thoughts? Somebody was asking me about Jemias Ramsey, and I hope oh, Jemias yeah. Ramsey Why? gets some opportunity. He's playing for Toronto. Oh, like on the big... We, really? He is on the Raptors. Okay. We might I get to see, see a little Jemias. Might get to see some Jemias. We will see. He had a sick... Um, windmill dunk in transition against the Pistons electric game electric Stop. game Stop. Um, yeah I'm interested to see a little Jemias out here I you know I'm gonna have to look up Jemias just because like spelling his first name is is one of the most difficult things ever and if somehow <laughs> he does something crazy in this game we're gonna have to spell it so uh, James I'll somebody has some playing. some lyrics here that's that read I'm a savage classy bougie ratchet do you know who sings those song that song no. Brendan? It's Meg the Stallion. Thank you. Yes, she'll okay. be at Bottle Rock. Mm. Oh, Bottle Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, Pearl Jam's coming to Golden One. And Bottle Rock. <laughs> and Bottle Rock. I know, right <laughs> yeah. afterwards. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. The J-A-H-M-I apostrophe U-S. Thank you, Hector. Um, I knew I was going to have to look it up. Uh, I do know Schoolboy. Uh, is it Schoolboy Q? Schoolboy Q. Q. Yeah. I did listen to the first six songs of the new album. Um, it was tough, tough for your boy. Like, I <laughs> really? Did you did you listen to the new Justin Timberlake album? No, no. I but I'm going to assume that like the reason I don't I didn't love Schoolboy Q and the reason why I I wouldn't like particularly I I wouldn't I wouldn't have the same feelings about Timberlake are probably like right in line. So like, I, I don't, huh. I don't like the, the repeated use of racial epithets in my, in my music listening. And I don't listen to music like that all the time. So I'm not used to it and it's jarring. And I'm like, yeah, I'm just not down. So, and I just, I have this feeling that Timberlake's not going to do that same thing. Okay. Well, yeah, I would say go listen to that because it's a fantastic album. Yeah. And I'm not saying that the, the Q stuff was bad. I actually had a good time listening to some of it. Um, like th there were a couple of tracks that were like, oh, this is really cool. So Kyle made me do it. My, my boy, Kyle, my boy, Kyle. He's, he's helping. Um, he's helping. Yes. Uh, we have something at, um, this will be my final thought. I have, I have built the, the fortress of snackitude at, uh, at the ESPN 1320 studios, which I that? hope that, I hope that Sean uh, comes in and joins me next month when uh, my friend Kyle's on vacation. <laughs> I've built a giant locker filled with snacks, which is the best thing ever. <laughs> and I wish we had this at Golden One Center where we had a locker that like a set of lockers for us media people that we could leave stuff there because uh, I would do the same thing there. Like I, I literally built out a, like a locker at the studio that a handful of people have to go to and can go and like help themselves to snacks all day long. It's it you might built be the this? Greatest. Well, no, I, I mean it's a locker. Like there's a locker system in at, oh. at the so you, put a bunch, so you put a bunch of snacks in an empty locker and put a lock <laughs> on it. That's all you uh, oh no, no. I like it's it's full fledged, like it's got everything in there. It's like pretty okay. spectacular. So um cool. Anyway, yeah. Uh outside of that, um, do I have any final thoughts? Um I can't look outside because it's dark. Uh but um let's see. Like this is a stretch run. I, I like we talked about this last year a little bit, and I think it was easier last year to make this statement. But this year, I kind of feel the same thing. Like I think fans need to step back from the ledge and just try to enjoy the ride here for the last what are we fifteen or sixteen games at this point? Fifteen. It's going to be wild. It's going to uh -huh. be like we have no idea what's going to happen here. But like, try to at least like sit back and go, okay, look, it could be worse. It could be sixteen years of just absolute ass basketball and uh we're, we're finally at an at a point where we're seeing a competitive team that's battling that's 11 games over 500 and battling for a playoff spot um so hopefully that's the way that it goes down the stretch and we get to see some cool stuff uh but if not you know they're a team that's growing and on the rise and so all of that's good stuff um i would much prefer to do this than to watch horrific bath basketball again and again and again like i was in the movie groundhog day which for brendan that was starring bill murray and annie mcdowell um and did they play the sunny sure. bono song again and again and again 
Um, okay. Are we all good? I think so. I think we're there. All right. I think we made it. I think we did make it. All right. That's going to do it for this edition of the King's Beat podcast. Make sure to turn tune into Fox 40 to listen to every and to see all that Sean does because Sean is doing great work over there. Thanks, man. Uh, football, baseball, basketball, local high school, everything you could possibly imagine. Eric Armstead stuff, all of this stuff. Uh, Brendan is also doing wonderful work with his new partner over at the King's Pulse podcast with Hunter Patterson. Uh, so shout out to That's our guy, Hunter. Point. He's a good dude. Uh, Brendan has something else going on that we dare not mention. It's true. <laughs> um, and uh, if you're hanging out and you want to talk or listen to basketball in the morning and all kinds of craziness, uh, join me and my friend Kyle Madsen on the Insiders from 10 to noon, Monday through Friday on ESPN 1320. So we are a Blue Wire podcast. We are brought to you by Price Picks. We are the King's Beat. Thanks for tuning in. So for... Box 40, Sean Cunningham, and Brendan Nunes from the King's Pulse Podcast. I am James Hamby, Kings Insider for ESPN 1320 and the King's Beat. You guys all have a good night.